Hi, I'm Doug Vo from the Die Hole Foundation. This is video four, uh, part two, where I'm going to cover the proof. This is the empirical evidence, uh, scientific evidence, that our sun does nova and it novas cyclically through time. The evidence shows up on the moon, the sedimentary evidence on the earth, a little bit of it. There's going to be a separate video, it'll be part four, that'll cover all the sedimentary evidence on the earth. Uh, evidence on Mars, and when the next reversal is going to happen. Okay, uh, what I'm going to cover is going to be mostly from Chapter 8 of, of uh, God's Air Judgment Book. And uh, uh, you've been taught in school that global warming, or now called um, climate change, is caused by us, CO2 that we put in the atmosphere. This video, as well as the previous one also, should basically put the death knell into that theory and you'll understand why uh, it was there. It was only merely a contraption of the Rockefeller Foundation who want to control the oil industry or the energy, energy completely and they want to use this mechanism. But also the CIA liked it because um, they knew in the future the place is going to get warmer because the sun's output is going to increase, as you'll see. So they needed an alternate explanation, and this looked like just a fine one. So that's what we're going to cover. <clears throat> By the way, if, if you're a school teacher and you see this, and you're being to told to teach your children that global warming is, is really mankind, and I've been told that the, the questions that you give students are really leading questions. And basically, that's not science. That's indoctrination, brainwashing. It's really going to hurt you, and you'll understand why it's going to hurt you uh, and everybody else in, in this video and the previous one also. Um, I found this verse, uh, this section in Plato. This was actually my first book, Reality Revealed, got 41 years ago. And I'll continue. There are two cycles of the world, and in one of them it is governed by an immediate province and receives life and immortality, and in the other it lets it go and has a reverse action during infinite ages. Reverse action, there, he's trying to say the earth changes rotation, and he did in one of his other books. Uh, anyway, this new action is spontaneous and is due to exquisite perfection of balance to the vast size of the universe and to the smallness of the pivot upon which it turns. That's the polar reversal, I told you. It happens in one day. Uh, <clears throat> all changes in the heaven affect the animal world and is being the greatest of them is most destructive to man and animals. At the beginning of the cycle before our very, very few of them had survived and on these a mighty change passed. Our ancestors, uh, thousands of years ago, knew about this event. They didn't know technically and scientifically had what was really going on or how to explain it, but they did the best they could. By the way, that philosophy was Jewish philosophy. <clears throat> In video one, part one of this, uh, I had shown you how the CIA controls or grossly influences the academic community. Uh, William Casey was the CIA director at the time of Reagan. George Bush, he just died a couple of days ago. And this is a quote from him. Uh, he was uh, head of the CIA for about one year, from January 76 to 77. That was during the Ford administration. Said Sarah, this is talking about Sarah McClendon, she was uh, White House reporter for many years. Uh, Sarah, if the American people ever find out what we have done, they would chase us down the street and lynch us. Well, this isn't really in reference to um, Iran Gate and um, selling arms to the Iranians. It's not that at all. Because you may get arrested for that, but why are the American people going to lynch you? The reason is, is he's thinking what they're really doing, which is basically to 
keep people from knowing the truth about the sun and what happens during the reversal. <clears throat> Here's some journal articles. Uh, I mentioned in the first video that scientists, some scientists know this event. This is a, a, a little inkling of which ones know and how they, they say it. This was from uh, R.H. Dickey from Nature Magazine, 1978. No support is found for the c conventional view of the sunspot cycle. Conventional view, he's talking about nuclear physics theory of what powers the sun. You know, hydrogen, big hydrogen bomb going off, come helium, gives off light and energy. No, it's not that. They know that. <clears throat> there exists a large random walk in the phase of the cycle. Instead of both sunspots and the DNHs, the solar and terrestrial weather indicators, seem to be paced by an accurate clock inside the sun. The clock cycle, which they never figured out. <clears throat> That's the 11.09 sunspot cycle and the 88.73 year Gleisberg cycle. They can't explain this, like I mentioned earlier. The standard physics model calls for the sun producing at least 5.8 neutrinos per day. That was the original estimate of how many it was going to create. And I had a big 100,000 gallons of carbon tetrachloride, you know, cleaning fluid to, they thought a neutrino would hit one of those atoms in there, chlorine, and become something else radioactive, and you could measure it. They didn't find any. Um, John Bacall concluded, the conflict between the observed and the standard theory has led many to spec speculations about the solar interior that were advanced because their proponents believe that the subject is in a state of crisis. That's nuclear physics in a state of crisis. Just like they couldn't explain mass, that had come up with the, the Higgs field. That's a resurrection of the ether theory, by the way. Okay. Now back to what's going on. <clears throat> this is the Kuiper Belt. When our sun novas, it blasts out dust, and they found the dust and the particles, the K-U-I-P-E-R belt, Kuiper Belt, Cooper Belt. And they found it past Neptune and Uranus. Um, and that's, that's where they found it. Uh, this dust shell goes at about 1,515 50 miles per second, very fast. What I think is going to happen when this thing happens, when the NOVA does happen, this is the sunspot cycle 1957. Uh, it was 300 and, 355 sunspots in one day. I think this section here, the equator is like across here of the sun. From here and here is going to blow out towards the planetary plane, us and all the other planets. The top and the bottom part is going to blow top and bottom. And you'll see an example of other stars that do it. Here's some examples. Well, this is the Cooper Belt and how they've measured it and spotted particles in this area. Uh, this is Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, J Jupiter, and there's the Sun. We're someplace in the middle here. Really kind of close. Uh, this is a super, uh, supernova of uh, G1.9. And it's estimated to be about 27,000 light years away. In other words, it blew at 24,000 light years or 24,000 years ago. Most of the pictures I'm going to show you with the different colors are a composite of uh, X-ray radio telescopes and optical telescopes, and they give different colors to different um, uh, measurements, and then they superimpose and create an image. There's the star there. It didn't blow up and become a, 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 black, uh, a black hole or anything like that. Here's some more examples. Uh, M57 or NGC 5720. The ring nebula, there's the star, there's the dust shell around it. Here's another one. Uh, this is about 4,000 light years away. So Tycho supernova, 13,000 light years. This thing blew, in other words, 12,000 years ago, and this is what you're looking at. This probably is accumulation of multiple novas. It's probably a very big star. Uh, Nova Able 30, estimated about 5,500 light years away. Uh, again, it's a composite, a composite uh, photograph you're looking at of multiple uh, readings. Here's a close-up of it. Again, this is the dust shell it sends out. Oh. Here's another one that's uh, two to 4,000 light years away. It's NGC 7009. Uh, this is the 
planetary plane. And this is probably a radio noise. Uh, a radio telescope picked this up, and that's why it's kind of split. So this is a planetary plane, and it blew top and bottom also. This one's kind of interesting. This is supernova 1987A. Here's different pictures of it as it blew from 94 on to 2016. And this is, you'll see a faint thing going on here and here, uh, composite, and here's a composite picture that they made. Uh, I stretched it out this way. This is its planetary plane, where its planets would be. And the north and south poles blew out this way. This is the ant, uh, ant um, nebula. Its planetary plane would be across here, and the north and south pole blew like that. Now, was, I've seen so many pictures of stars that have nova they call them planetary nebulas. I explained in the previous, they're not. It's a star that know of it. And uh, they all look a little different. They're like different personalities. Oh, uh, let me show you one thing that was kind of interesting. This one here, they estimate 168,000 light years away. That comes out to almost exactly 14 of these 12,068 cycles back. I was dead on it. Kind of interesting. Okay, these are some journal articles, and I actually have them. <laughs> this one right here. Uh, are supernovas explosions driven by magnetic springs? This guy definitely knew the sun nova. A few scientists have theorized that magnetic springs periodically go off in the center of the sun is, is the mechanism uh, would explain the tremendous dust shell uh, velocities observed. So they're constant during a glaciation. There's another article by uh, D.W. Uh, Parkin. The regular cyclical appearance of the Ice Age proves that some kind of clock cycle is present in our universe. Others have concluded the same. This is the quote from him. From core evidence and climate seems cyclical, crudely sinusoidal, which perhaps systematically increases amplitude and period for the latter cycle. I su uh, suggest that some solar periodicity is the prime cause of the major climate cycles. He knows that the sun knows and the sun is the cause of it. By the way, there was an article, 78 or something like that, or, or so, or 79 by a scientist. He counted over a thousand journal articles to show the relationship between the sun and earth weather. Not CO2. Not, so keep, continue driving your trucks, your SUVs, and use your hibachi and your barbecue. Don't worry about it. You're not causing mommy nature any damage. This one you'll enjoy. For some, this was a paper. It's a book done, uh, paid by NATO, but mostly by us. It was at 15 articles. The book's like $300. The University of Washington had it. And I found it. And it was done 1987. And the reason why they, the, the military wanted to have this fund, the fund's about whether CO2 had any cause on global weather. They wanted to know the truth, so they paid at least 15 scientists, I Xerox, maybe half of them, because they were all good articles. And this is what was in there, and I'll, I'll read it to you. This is the, this is the reference here. Uh, variations in solar luminosity are expected to give rise to variations in average sea surface temperatures, SST. By the way, that's one of the ways you, you measure solar output, is by that reflection of the light off the couple of planets and, and a moon. Um, um, solar wind and sunspots and stuff like that. I'll continue. We conclude that a modulation of the sun's luminosity with a period of about 80 years, that's the Gleisberg cycle, and an amplitude of about 0.5% is consistent with global average direct sea surface temperature measured, <coughs> but that the consistency of the results is weakened if, the, if calculated response to the increase in atmospheric CO2 included in the model. In other words, CO2 had no effect whatsoever. Here's his results from his, this is, this is with no CO2 effect. 
this line here is the sea surface temperature. You'll notice from the beginning of our last Gleisberg, the previous Gleisberg cycle was here, a steady increase. Then here, this is our, our big uh, Gleisberg cycle of, of 57, early 58. And it's gone up, very less like that. This is, see how much higher this is from this period here. Make all of you worried. This is really what's going on. This is the secret. This is where you, you, you calculate in the effect of CO2. There's almost no effect whatsoever. Okay. Like I said in the, the first part of the, the part one of the sun, <clears throat> the space program was created to find out if the sun nova, one of the first projects was to go on the moon when they went on the, because it has no atmosphere, Whatever landed there would still be there, not affected by water, wind, wind, rain, whatever. Okay, so this is what they found on the moon. Glass beads, of usually point, point 0.1 to about one millimeter uh, in diameter. Um, so I'll go through. This is what they, they found. Uh, when our sun novas... It, it creates a lot of radioactive elements because of the cosmic rays, which are basically atomic bullets hitting other atoms, and they create isotopes. So this is what they found on, in, these, uh, in these glass beads. Uh, aluminum 26, beryllium 10, oxygen 18 and 16, magnesium 26, iron 60, thorium 230, etc. There was more also. Scientists have de uh, detected an increase of 50% to 80% of radioactive elements 1,100 year plus years ago on Kodiak Island. Um, that's in the, the journals. Now, on, the, on part four, I'm going to cover the sedimentary evidence, just what was found on the Earth. <coughs> and, okay, F. Singer Science, here's some of the references you can go to to go find it. And um, this is an anomaly in a deep sea. Mag Mang um, manganese crust and implications for a nearby supernova source. You know, they found some of these radioactive elements on the skin of manganese nodules from the bottom of the ocean. Um, here's green glass, green bees. They found Apollo 15 samples. So, uh, okay. The expelled matter shell consists of glass beads, lumps of molten glass, dust and rocks, thrown out at very high temperatures as a reference for it. When the sun novas, it throws off its outer dust shell and matter shell into space at an estimate speed of 1,515 miles per second. That's my estimate, because I know what side of the Earth uh, 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 the nova saw, and 17 to 18 hours later, where the dust shell hit. So I know it was about that speed. Uh, they came with a speed like 1,500 miles per second. The dust shell consists of small microtactites, glass beads, one to one millimeter to two millimeters with, with the sun's fingerprint inside. The fingerprint are fission tracks within the glass beads um, put there by the cosmic ray burst the sun gives off. NASA found that about 27% of the soil surface on the surface of the moon facing the Earth is made up of these glass beads. There's your reference for it. The reason why I'm giving you these references is it, there's over 400 references just in Chapter 8 of God's Day Judgment book. Uh, because this means your life. This thing's going to happen in less than 28 years. And that's why you're going to have more hurricanes, tornadoes, more earthquakes and volcanoes, I'll explain in in uh, part four, but this means your life. And as the first part of this, this series showed, they lied to you about a lot of different things, didn't they? And, but they're scared. They didn't think, they didn't see another alternative to, to do this. Anyway, and they're wrong. Two basic shapes, you have the round ones and you have the elongated beads, which I'm gonna show you in, in a moment. They'll look like little dumbbells. All these microtactiles were devoid of gas bubbles. In volcanic activity, you have gas bubbles. You're going you're to see it in, in a couple of slides later. 
The moon bees are colored clear, pale green, and yellow, red, orange, amber, dark brown, and black. Each color represents a slightly different chemical composition. In other words, when the sun novas, that dust shell, you cannot assume that it's all homogeneous, all the same elements. Uh, it's obviously not, just from the surface of the moon. I'll tell you something interesting. Between junior college and regular college, 1967, I went gold mining up at the Klondike with a friend. And nobody has ever found the Hard Rock Mine, the source of where all that gold was, from Nome, Alaska, all the way to the Klondike. I was in Dawson City um, on Last Chance Creek and the Yukon. They don't know where it came from. I'm wondering that one of these dust shells when the Sun Novas had gold, it <laughs> just deposited a lot of it. Because it's all dust. It's all little tiny nuggets. Just a random thought there. Um, this is the orange beads from Apollo 17 mission. There's the orange one, the dark ones. The dark ones have more iron in it. Uh, the dark colors are more, are more iron, as, as they said. They all have fission tracks and a lack of bubbles. Of the orange beads found, the chemical composition, composition did not match the composition of the surrounding rock. Uh, Dr. Roeder and uh, Vilden concluded that the lunar beads could have been ejected in an expanding cloud where the individual particle leaves the central source, the sun, of radiant heat at high velocity. There's the reference. They're saying a nova. These folks know it's a nova. Absolutely. <clears throat> Orange bees indicate a high content of titanium, besides a very high content of zinc, copper, and nickel, which excluded the possibility of volcanic origin for the glass beads. There's your reference for it. Nature in 1973. See, from 69 to about 76, as they, as they started bringing back the samples from the, the moon, <laughs> they had only concluded one thing. Sometime in between there, either early 70 or late 60, is the CIA decided to, we're going to make sure no one is led to the conclusion we've, we've proven that the sun does nova. Apollo 16 lunar samples indicated no evidence of volcanic rock, but they did find rocks that were coated with dark gray glass they also showed signs of partial melting. Also, this glass and melting was on the top of the rock, not below it. It was what faced the sun. <clears throat> Researchers have, have, have shown that some of the glass exhibited low temperature shock cracks, indicating collisions after the glass had solidified, such as in the flight to the moon. There's your references. This is the other shape that they, they found on the moon elongated beads. Now it was two beads got stuck together and they spun. It was found that in order to form that shape, glass ball would have to rotate in excess of 500 to 1,000 revolutions per second. That translates to 30,000 to 60,000 RPMs. That's not from an impact. That's not from a volcano. Got it? That's when you're traveling at 1,550 50 miles per second. Um, which eliminates the possibility of the dumbbells forming from volcanic activity or meteoric impacts. There's your reference. There's many more references. I have you know, hundreds, literally. <clears throat> Ample evidence for surface melting was found on the moon. Meteors and other material found there had an abundance of aluminum-26, which can only be produced from a nova or supernova. It therefore seems that the lunar melting provided, provides additional evidence for a supernova preceding formation of the solar system by no more than a few million years. He doesn't mean the formation of our solar system at all. He knows it's the last 12 or 15,000 years at Ken Kuzman's uh, letter showed that scientists know it. They just covered this stuff up so they can get it published. But yeah, they know it happens. Because look at it this way. <clears throat> Sun Novas, whatever was there previously gets baked and melted. That's why the Bible actually says the moon turns red. Well, it turned red because it's melting. 
And then when the dust shell hits it, it puts a new deposit of dust on top of it. Thomas Gold, I love Thomas Gold. He's now deceased. <clears throat> in, 19, uh, in 1969, was the first to suggest that flash from the sun could explain all the observe, observations he saw of samples and pictures from the moon, including rocks with a glaze ma uh, mainly on top. He went as far as to write, the phenomena may not be in the nature of a flare, but in the nature of a very minor Nova-like outburst of the sun. <laughs> There's your reference, folks. Science, volume 168, 1969. Read it yourself. His job, they had a whole bunch of small craters, like from five inches to about a couple of yards. And they found some molten glass there, and the whole sides were like molten glass. And they were trying to figure out, his job was to figure out what caused that. So he pegged it. You know, it's not just glass beads, it's blobs of molten stuff, glass, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> the fingerprint of the sun, without question, are these fission tracks and the radioactive elements. Here's a sample that came from the sun. Uh, enriched um, melanite grain from Apollo 12, rock sample number 1204. Uh, here's the fission tracks. and the, oh, Sorry, all these little holes are the fission tracks. Quite a few, huh? Here's one from an apatite crystal here on the Earth. Now, what's usually taught in school that uh, cosmic ray is a hydrogen or, or um, helium atom at, that's thrown off its electron and it's like a little bullet, but that's not true. Um, I got many journals. Here, plutonium-244, fission tracks, evidence of a lunar rock 3.95 billion years old. So every element you can imagine is going to be like a little bullet getting shot out. And they know that from the size of the hole in the, in the material. The problem is, is when you have glass beads that are 0.1 to about 1 millimeter, the way they do this, they, they shave the, the metal, the, the uh, mineral, the rock. Then they stain it, and then you see the holes that are left by the cosmic rays. It's kind of hard to do it with a little tiny bead, but they did it in some of the samples. I couldn't get pictures of any of them, but they wrote about them and what they did. This is the problem of not only cosmic ray dating, but also carbon-14 dating. Their philosophy is uh, a continual, um, uniform uh, exposure of cosmic rays throughout time. Now you know that's not true at all, <laughs> because uh, every 12,068 years, you get that. So that's really what's going on. But in their theory, in their supposition, it was wrong. It's not linear at all. It's, it's this. Every 12,068 years, you've got another spike, uh, an increase whether it's carbon-14 dating or you try to date something with fission tracks, this is what you're going to have to deal with. You know, it's where do you find the sample? That's it. Remember this. Now, I said in, in part one, at least I, part one, that I felt that China and India were on the side of the Earth that saw the sun actually nova, not just from the Hindu mythologies, but physical evidence. This is actually fission tracks found in bone found in um, Mongolia. Now, when they date the samples, this is dated samples from, oh, this was China. You know, this is the current. You go back in time, uh, carbon-14 at the 10,000, 13,000 years ago, 11, 6, 11. But then you got down to here, all of a sudden, 7,700 years, 7,800, 7,900 years. Here's the reversal. Carbon-14 dated 13,000. So why do you have this younger period below older period? Now you know why. Because... If all of a sudden you have a spike of, of cosmic rays from the nova, 
you're going to have an increase of carbon-14 dating, carbon-14, which means you think it's younger than the older stuff. But, it, but you can see this is impossible unless you understand what I just explained to you, that you've got something happening here. The sun novas produce a, a tremendous amount, I don't know how much, additional carbon, uh, carbon-14 by the cosmic rays. This is from a, a, a mica crystal also found in China, loaded with, with um, fission tracks of various sizes. Uh, here's lunar glass, again, the green stuff. This is found, olivonite, which is the same thing, same chemical composition, but kind of melted together. When it landed, it must have melted. But it's the same material. Here's our samples from the moon. This is from the Australian tactite basin. No glass, no air bubbles, same shape. This was probably even split. It probably was another end over here and it split. Here it is, there. Same glass round beads, same elongated. Once you see that, you know it had to have been extremely fast to wind up creating this shape. Here, this is from London, London clay. Here's the pale yellow colors. That's one of the colors that they got from the moon. There it is. There they are, three of them. Here, this one's coming, almost coming apart. It was so tiny. This one here, too. Look, two dots, and they got spread out. They must have spun at about 60,000 RPM. Certainly not from a volcano. I don't know of any volcanoes in London, do you? Chesapeake Bay, there is an ancient, ancient meteor impact, they think. But this is the same material and same chemical composition found on the moon. Here's your pale yellow beads. This is beads from a volcano, Hawaii volcano in 1969. The black dots are the gas bubbles. That's what the signature of glass being created in a volcano. This is not. You see no glass beads here. This is from the sun. Okay, Mars. I'm hopefully not going to run too long. When they landed on Mars, um, they knew they had the same problem. It was no, n nothing contradicted what they saw on the moon. Um, this is the size of the Mars, this is the size of the moon, uh, Earth. I tried to do this in scale. Earth is a diameter of 7,900 miles. Um, Mars is 4,200 miles. So it's, it's much more. It's 53% of the size of the Earth. Now, that may have an effect of how long they were able to keep an ocean, but I'll show you what they found. <clears throat> this is off the coast of uh, the Carolinas. And I showed this in the earlier video. This is deep sea canyons that go all the way down to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the same thing. I actually showed it in that other thing. It's the same thing. Here's their Martian continental shelf. And here's the, the water cutting grooves in, in the thing for the, same, for the same exact purpose. On part three, I'm going to go through the evidence in the ocean. You'll see the gory details of that. Here's another example. There's their continental shelf. Here's as the water cuts down on the continental shelf that goes to the bottom of where the ocean used to be. Here's another Martian basin. An ocean was here. Here's the cuts here. Here's the, the mantle here. Another example, we assume this is their, their continental shelf of something. And here's evidence of water running down here and cutting these grooves. Here's a blow up of another example. This is probably the continental shelf and it cuts again deep, deep canyons in the side of the wall into the ocean. Here's the last one I'll show. Continental shelf, same thing. Long, long, all the way down to the bottom. This is the evidence that there was an ocean here. Uh, this looks exactly like when I went to the, the Sinai uh, where you had it one time during the Cretaceous period, it was an ocean there. You have the limestone, the Cretaceous limestone. You can actually see the striations in this thing. And you have a, 
limestone, they have sand, limestone, sand, same exact thing I saw in the Sinai. No difference. Especially, you can see it more clearly here. See that? Same thing. Question you should all be asking, okay, where'd all the water go? <laughs> That's the purpose of this whole thing. Now, here's the evidence of rivers. Here's a river. I'll talk about this later. Here's an obvious example of a river. Where did all the water go? Once you see a river, you know it had an atmosphere, it had rain, and it had erosion. So it had everything the Earth has, just smaller scale. Here's another example of a river. I'll talk about this later. Very good example of a river on Mars. More of the same. This, when I first looked at it, I said, this is river rock, you know, limestone river rock, highly washed. Then I looked, I noticed there was all, all most of these rocks have this opening or a space between the gravel here and this. You see this in freezing, uh, an area where it freezes and the water is, is um, the gravel has a lot of water in it and it's got a rock, then it freezes, then it thaws out, you'll get this thing. In this case, this probably had water and then the water evaporated and then it leaves this opening around the rocks. But this is, what's also interesting, the rocks look like they're all coated with those gla same glass beads. <laughs> Evidence of life on Mars. There's a picture, someone else found it. I drew a straight line here. I got three points here, and I drew a straight line through the points. The shadow it leaves is kind of square at the base of these two. Don't know about this here. This is not natural. Nobody can explain why three things, and these are probably pretty, pretty tall. I don't know how tall they are, because I don't know the altitude this picture was taken at. This isn't natural. What you saw on the on, the, um, uh, on those two rivers. This one here, looks like a bow of a ship and the stern of the ship and something up here. It's, it's casting a shadow, so means it has elevation. And this is the riverbed here. It looks like a boat. The red could be iron oxide, rust. Same thing goes here. That's not a natural, I can tell you as a geologist, this isn't natural. No way you could explain this as being natural. Again, this is probably a seabed, what you're looking at here. This could be ancient shellfish, what's remaining of it, like an, a sea urchin, a home. <laughs> uh, they circled two things, but I can't make out what, what they're trying to say here, so I don't know. But I can't comment, this is not natural. This, is not, this has to be made by some kind of life form. This is the picture here. This really looks like it's been dusted by a bunch of beads again, those orange beads from the, from the sun. But this thing kind of fascinated me, so I blew it up. If this doesn't look like something organic or plastic, either the rover is shedding plastic, which I doubt seriously. We've got something that's fossilized probably, but look, look all these little tiny, these little tiny beads on top of rock. This has been dusted by the sun. That's what all these little beads are here. But this is not natural. This is some kind of plant life or something else, but it doesn't belong there. This was from another, somebody else found this on one of the pictures. This looks like a rodent. You got two legs here, you got a head here, you got a tail. That, again, as a geologist, this is not a natural formation. It's a little small little thing. Here's another one photographed. That's an eye. That looks like a rat. There's a, a front leg. The shadows look the same as the rock, so it's not wrong there. And the, and the coloring is the same. The pixels looked okay. Looks like a, like a, a mummified rodent. There's really nothing on the surface of, the, of Mars that would decay it. 
This is also not natural. Somebody found it, a picture on the side of a cliff, a uh, roaded valley of some sort. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not natural. That, that you can say for sure, it's not natural. Could be a thigh bone, but it is a bone. This one, this picture you can see on, online, this is what they first saw. Then the guy blew it up. I blew it up even more. This is a head. This is definitely an arm. You know, this part of the arm has got the brownish color. I think I know why. I think NASA colorized this stuff and the program screwed up and colorized this arm. This looks like a bust of a woman and there's her leg. That's not natural. That is a statue. This one somebody called a town. They're probably right. It looks like this thing was flooded, covered with dust and mud, and then another process uncovered some of it. These square things are not natural. So I blew this one up in this area. This is it. This is not natural. This is made by some intelligence, probably is a town. It is, there's too many of them here. This is, and single ones also. This is not natural. This is evidence of some intelligence was there a very long time ago and built something. Okay. <clears throat> what happened to the water? That's the real question that, that NASA and the CIA couldn't cover up. What happened to all the water that was on Mars? Why is it out there? It looked like it had life on it, but where did it all go? Now you're going to know why. <clears throat> I'll get on this side. Here's our dear sweet sun. This is not in scale, obviously. <clears throat> Venus, Earth, Mars. Mars should be smaller than Jupiter, Saturn, etc. When this thing novas and this dust shell hits each one of the planets, it, it evaporates whatever atmosphere is on it, at least a lot of it. It evaporates in one of your, water and stuff like that. And it carries some of that water out, as I explained in the first part of the videos, as a comet. And that's why a comet has a radically elliptical orbit all coming back to the sun. Because that is the thing that produced the velocity for the water, this big, this big uh, snowball going out into space. So what happened to dear sweet Mars is Mars at one time had the same orbit as the Earth and closer to. And over time, after repeated novas, it got f pushed further away from the sun and lost most of its water. The same thing's going to happen to the Earth. We know 78 and 100 million years ago, we had more water. The Earth was covered with, I think, 80 or 90 percent water. <laughs> Funny, the Bible says the same thing, too. And and eventually we will lose, we'll be in this kind of an orbit, and we are going to have to immigrate to the next planet closer. And that's most likely what the people who are here went there, to Earth, because they had no choice. So, I'd say that Jupiter, Saturn, um, Uranus, and Neptune had the same issue. At one time, they were in this part here and most likely had life on it. This is a story of evolution that you are forced to evolve upward, not be dumb and stupid, not lie, but tell the truth so people can figure out what the danger is and what you have to do to save, your, save yourself from this event. The Torah, believe it or not, and I did mention it in video 7, which is on God's 11th code system, has the exact month, the day, and the year for the next reversal. The next Gleisberg cycle will be, between, will be between September and December 2046. Um, it has a month and day there. The first time a month and day is mentioned by the Torah, it's the most important. Second month, 17th day, turns out to be October 16th. But where's the year? You don't care about month and day. What year is it going to be? Well, he told us. You take from Adam to Abraham when they had their first kid, except this one is his, it's his third kid, 
and you add it up, and what number does it come up to? 2,046. The distur disturbing factor for me is that this is the Christian calendar. You know, it doesn't matter what the Jews of the first and second century who were fighting the Pisos and the Romans did or not. They were going to lose anyway. So the Christian calendar was going to survive. So this message is for us, for nobody else. Moses couldn't have known this. No way. <clears throat> Die Hole Foundation is 501c3. It's a science foundation, even though we do cover religious subjects. But you know why. It, it, it basically overlapped by accident. Anyway, um, go on the website. You can make a contribution there. It's to do the research and also hire geologists to do additional work, to fig basically to figure out when the next reversal is going to be. <laughs> Or, and what side of the earth is going to be facing when it happens. Other than that, I thank you for listening. I hope you learned something.